All right, guys, hope everybody's doing well tonight. I uh, wanted to kind of touch base, give you a brief little clinic on um, some things that we talk about in terms of defensive game planning here at West Brunswick. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions this offseason um, from, from people that – other high school coaches um, talking about some of the things we do schematically on defense, and that's all fine and dandy. But, you know, I'm one of those guys – I've never really been married to a system in terms of, of what we do, whether or not it's offense or defense. I, I think, you know, if you look at the top 20 offenses in the state of North Carolina, uh, you have Southern Nash, for instance, who lines up foot to foot and scores 50 points a game, uh, turn around and handed it off. Brian Foster does a great job. Or you have, um, you know, guys like Myers Park who throw it around the yard. It, it, there's no difference defensively. There's people who win um, and play great defense, running even front, running odd front, being multiple, being very base. Um, what I do think separates, and it, I took a, I've done a deep dive into um, high school football, as a, as a case may be, in the state of North Carolina. And there's over there's 415 schools. Uh, we finished sixth out of 415 schools and points allowed per game this year. It was second um, in the 3A ranks. So out of probably 125 uh, 3A programs, we were second in points allowed um, behind only Weddington, who won the state championship. In fact, um, when I share the screen here in a minute, I'll kind of go through while I think playing championship defense still correlates um, and it's it's ironic that when you looked at when you look at a lot of the teams on here, most of them were playing into the second, third, fourth round of the playoffs, and the teams who were winning state championships were you know newsflash at eleven. They were really good. They were top twenty, top thirty on offense and defense over the course of four hundred and fifteen uh, teams. So you're talking about most teams in this top 20 that I'll show were probably top five or six in their own classification against schools. So we, you know, when we get into a deep dive um, of what people are doing, this is from Chris Hughes' website on carolinapreps.com. And these were the top 20 uh, defensive programs in the, in the state of North Carolina, as the case may be with, you know, you see my mouse right here points against per game. So from one to 20, basically everybody on this list was a double digit winner um, with the exception of Providence Day, who looks like they won eight and then White Bull who won nine um, down there at 13 and 15, you know, New Hanover who was in our league and actually beat us twice played you know, they were a great defensive football team obviously, and they won 13. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, you try and take an inventory of what people ahead of you did and how, how you know, if we want to ever win a state championship here, what we have to do um, to win one. And then three of the five teams in the top five won the state championship or played for the state championship. Two won it. Tarboro lost to East Surrey in the 1AA ranks. Uh, Weddington actually won our classification, I believe, was in the top 20 in scoring offense as well. And then Reedsville, the juggernaut that Coach T has over there, was in the top five offensively and defensively. So, you know, I, and I, I would guess if you took an inventory of uh, every team here, you know, you might see – uh, a healthy variety of, of schemes and, and you're, you're seeing a healthy variety of, uh, you know, talent levels and what people and what people have, for instance, you know, I, I know a lot about three of the teams on this league because of, because of who we play, whether or not it's us, New Hanover, um, or White Bull. And for instance, New Hanover did not have a, um, uh, division one signee this year, on their defense, but what they had, they had 11 really, really good high school football players that were in the right spots and they made plays. Uh, we had a division one nose tackle. Um, and then we had an FCS signee and, you know, there's probably some, we had a lot of good players, very similar to what New Hanover had, but, you know, you've also got some people on here that are stopped and loaded with division one talent. So how do you balance knowing 
you know, there's a lot of people who can't coach talent too. I think everyone kind of throws shade at some people who've got these great players. You got to put them in the right spot too, um, comparatively. So there's there's going to be a going to be a healthy variety of what you do to play great defense at the high school level. Some of it's scheme, but most of it still comes down to making sure you're sound. And we'll talk. You know, I wanted to talk tonight about you know, basic game plan philosophies that we have in our defense. So when we got here, they had given up 36 points a game in the 2017 season. And they were four and seven, maybe four and eight. And even in our first year, we were five and six, but I thought we were making significant strides defensively in what we were doing. We actually cut that down from 36 to 21 points a game. And then this year, we really got off to a great start in our non-conference. We shut out Sockesty. Uh, we shut out Whiteville. And then we held a pretty good carry team to uh, 14 points. And seven of those points were on a short field. And the confidence continued to grow. And, you know, what I do, what I believe we do a great job of is, is – uh, we tweak our system to go to try and go from being really good on defense as we were in 2017 to being really, you know, like a, an elite defense, if you will. I mean, I'm certainly not patting ourselves on the back, but the numbers do speak for themselves. Um, you know, we held eight teams below 120 yards offensively this year, which was, you know, certainly a great number. And, um, you know, we we gave up 20 points or more uh, three times, and is the case may be in all three of those games, we gave up uh, a short field touchdown in two of the games and then two short field touchdowns in another one of the games. So uh, essentially, I think we probably gave up six drives this year of over 40 yards per touchdown. So, I mean, it was obviously a great year for us, but um, I think it's a combination of, of having a really good coordinator. Caleb Pardew who calls our defense, does a great job. And the thing that I like that Caleb does, he really balances out probably where I'm weakest, which is defensive line play. Um, I do have my hands on the defense just because the secondary is my passion. It's my favorite thing to coach. And, you know, got some really good players back there. But as most people know, if you've ever coached the secondary, they're usually the ones who challenge you the most. Um, you know, in the classroom or off the field, but I love them because they bring it on Friday nights. And we've got a, a great group of kids back there, but also that's my passion and my favorite thing to coach. So um, I will, t I talk to you guys from, from a little bit of a background as a, uh, a I've been a college position coach and I've coached the linebackers and I've coached the outside backers and the safeties as a position coach. And then when I was the coordinator at North Greenville University, I was I coached the inside backers actually. But since I've been back at West Brunswick, I've gotten back to my roots a little bit where I coach the corners and the safeties. So when Caleb and I meet, I mean obviously we meet as a defensive staff like everybody else does, but we're gonna kind of go through the one, two, threes of of what we talk about each week um, as we get into the year. So I'm just gonna slide on over. Let's make sure you guys can see that. And this is what we talk about. This is a Google Doc. I'm willing to share this with anybody. Uh, these are just some things that that I want to know. And I'm not, guys, I'm not going through our whole weekly check sheet. I'm not going to insult anybody's intelligence. I mean, certainly you have to chart tricks. You have to chart run pass. You have to do your cut-ups. You have to do all of that. But I'm talking from an overall philosophical point of when I leave the office or when I cut huddle off on Sunday night, I want to have an idea of these things, all right? And I think this will really help. One thing I see a lot, of, I see a lot of young guys who've never been coordinators, they fall into, I'm going to watch this and we're going to put this scheme in. And they think the magic sauce is scheme in a sense, I don't think it is, and, I, and I'll get into why why I don't believe in that being the answer. I believe in a system, and I believe in in giving your kids four or five nuggets about the opponent 
that allows you to play fast. It allows you to play physical and it allows you to play on time because if I'm doing something for the millionth time, I'm going to do it better than if you installed this play just because it's good against this particular front or this route concept because it's good against this particular coverage. And so my first thing is we, we see a great deal of variety down here in terms of system. I've had a lot of fun uh, because in college football, when I was coaching defense, um, I guess last in college football would have been the 2012 season. Um, you know, we pretty much saw 11 personnel or triple option, and that was as much as the variety got. Now, out of that 11 personnel set, we saw people who throw it. We saw people who were doing what everybody else is doing with the H back now. Uh, we we see it all down here. I mean, for instance, in our last year, we played Soxty and North Brunswick, who were flex bone triple option teams. Uh, we played White Bull, who is a tempo, a tempo wing T team. Um, we played Topsail, who is a s sort of sophisticated uh, 10, 11 personnel passing team. Uh, but they'll get into some three back, you know, power eye stuff. So you got to be ready to fit that too. Um, you know, I have such a great deal of admiration for Dylan Dimmick at, at New Hanover because it, it almost feels like I'm back there on Saturdays with all the, with all the formations that, that he can give you at New Hanover. You know, they implement some power stuff, some, some spread stuff, and they do it out of one or two personnel groupings. So you can't get an idea. You really have to, be able to rely on your kids to make a check system, whether because you're not going to get them in the right call all the time because you know they can put their tight end in about five different spots, they'll put their running back in about five different spots, um, and so on and so on. So there's multiplicity and having to build a system within that because if you're trying to, you know, if, if you're trying to guess against all those formations and they're doing them all in the personnel group they're going to hit three or four home runs and the game's over. Uh, then we see South Brunswick, who's wing T, um, you know, Union Pines with Lonnie Cox. They did a great job attacking us this year in the first round of the playoffs. They were more of a, uh, you know, air rage screen game type deal. Um, we, we did succeed in making them one-handed and took away their running game, but, you know, still they were able to, to effectively throw the ball a little bit on us. Um, especially in the screen game. So so we see a quite quite a little bit of, of everything. So talking about, you know, really what we do. Number one, who are they? You know, and, and I can pretty much get a feel for that after one or two um, film sessions. You know, if I don't know who they are, that's not going to be good for them on Friday night. Um, you know, if you're lining up one week and you've got a core of – these plays in one formation and then the next week your core plays are totally different and your formations are totally different you're just probably not very good you know I thought you know I was talking about Dylan's multiplicity a minute ago um he's incredibly good at running those same four or five plays that he runs so his front five get really good at blocking them but you know the 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 window dressing is in the different formation picture. It's not in that. It's not in a sense that it's a different play. So I want to know who you are. What are what are your four or five core run schemes? Um, what are your two or three core drop back schemes? When do you like to sprint out? So on and so on. Um, you know, and I I I think good offensive coaches subscribe to this theory: players, formations, plays in that order. So for instance, I'm going to look at a stat sheet. And if you've got one kid who's caught 50 balls and the next guy's caught 22 balls and I throw it around the yard, you know, there's a reason you know, that coach thinks that receiver is a good player or he knows that quarterback can only handle one read. All right. So I say that in a sense of from a matchup standpoint, if your best player is a wide receiver and I don't feel like – I think you have a dominant X, but you don't have a Z or a W that can beat, beat you, I'm going to manipulate to make sure that I've got matchup examples to where you know, I don't, I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence. You know, if you've got Michael Jordan – 
and uh, this whole last dance thing's got me going, okay, do you want to double team him with two lesser players or do you want to put your best player on him? Those are both good options. What you can't do is just play left and right corners unless you've got two really good ones, which is the case is we've been pretty good at both of those spots. Um, but if he's a dominant X, I'm going to put a longer, better player on him, or I'm going to put really my number two and number three on him. I'm going to double. I'm going to bracket. I'm going to do something like that. Um, but understanding that if I do that, I'm losing a guy in there. So, so I want to be able to do that. And then, But I also got to make sure that I can align – to formations. If you're sitting there saying this, you know, I'll get into some thought processes here in a minute, but if you want to line up in a certain formation, okay, I know they have this type of number to a bubble side, they have this type of plays to a three-man surface, and how do I get proper leverage and support to what they like to do in those core plays to there? Like I said, so if, if I know I'm playing wing T, for instance, I know I've got to be able to fit belly ISO to the two-man surface, and i got to be able to fit buck sweep to the three-man surface. If I'm facing 11 men, if I'm facing 11 personnel with an H-back, I pretty much know that H-back is the guy who can create, unless they run counter trade, but that H-back is the guy who can create an extra gap to either side of the football. All right, so that's where I know I've got to be able to get people. I don't necessarily care what the certain plays are, but I, like I just said, I do need to know, okay, they do have counter trays, so that might screw with my, my reads or my thinking a little bit. And, and I'll get to that when I start talking about point A down here, safety support, and then we talk about plays. So, you know, for instance, if I can get lined up to each formation, and I've got certain numbers, does that play give us problems? Nope. Does this play give us problems? Nope. Does this play give us problems? Nope. Well, they don't have this. They don't have that. But if they give us this, this might cause us a problem. So, you know, from a game plan standpoint, it might be adding a certain line movement up front. For instance, if I know I've got, you know, if I've got a weak side three technique, but they might have something that gets us or they have something that really exploits us like a midline concept or something. I might put another movement on there, muddy up that wheel backer or something. But if it's not part of the core and they haven't shown it at all, I'm not going to cover ghost. All right. I want to be sound against players first. Don't let the other team's best player beat you. Okay and then at formations, and then we can start worrying about plays. And I've already hit on this. Does the guy want to out-scheme you? If he subscribes to that, number one, they're not going to be very good late in ball games. I believe that wholeheartedly because what he's going to try and do, he's going to try and continue to get his kids in the perfect play call. All right. I want to hang my hat on my ability to adjust within my system or our system because this thing is – morphed into a conglomeration of what Caleb's brought from other places we've been to, to things that we've done. But, you know, you cannot look at West Brunswick and say, gosh, they gave us something completely different than what we expected. Like our nuances are change-ups during the week. For instance, it looks, if you watched us against Cary or Union Pines this year, who were the two teams I thought could really throw the football, um, or, I mean, did an effective job throwing the football against us out of spread sets. Obviously, like I said, New Hanover did a good job, but they would get a little bit more condensed and uh, things of that nature. But Union Pines and Cary, I'm talking 10 personnel stuff. Like, you would say, okay, they're going to play either man free or cover three the whole game to this. Um, and maybe on third down, getting some read two stuff or whatever. Well, within that, match concept that we have we have about four different calls and they think okay I do this I do this I'm going to manipulate the strong safety and we're going to do that well we made one check based on a split at halftime based on something that was giving us credit and both of their quarterbacks thought we were in man and we dropped off into what we call a, a clamp call which is a, a bastardized in out call based on what the number two receiver does 
and it gets our corner out of zone. It locks him in man, but then they basically play zone on number two and three, and both of them got a huge uh, second down pick in that game. Um, the ability to adjust within the system. So we know, Caleb and I know during the week, okay, these are the one high beaters that they're going to go to because this is what we've seen on film. And, okay, they finally got us in man. They kind of got us in man. Okay, where do we morph into the half man, half zone thing? You know, I'm not going to be a defense of the week. Our kids have made that call a thousand times in practice. Hey, just be ready when we call match this time if they get in that tight split between two and three to make this call and so on and so on. So we're going to, I say all that to say, we find something that we do regularly. Okay. Meaning how we defend South Brunswick this year in the wing tees going to look very, I don't mind saying this out loud. It's going to look very similar to how we're going to defend them next year the changes are going to be the little nuance things like a movement, all right, within the same front or a cat call within the same safety structure, if you will, because here's the deal, guys. Even if they know how you line up and they understand that there's going, number one, the magic of what we do is in the movements, in the odd front. Uh, I still feel good about my ability to not have to blitz our team into the perfect call every week. It's still going to be on, you know, quote unquote, the difference as Jay Bateman at Carolina calls it, it's still coming down to leverage block shedding and tackle. Okay. So, and if you're sound one year, you're going to be sound the next. All right. So making sure your kids are in a proper position where they can beat leverage and teach them and let them see that picture all week from where they're going to line up on Friday nights. All right. So that kind of gives you an idea in a theory about what we do. Now, here is kind of my seven points. All right, guys, there's more to it. I don't mean to oversimplify this. Uh, for anybody in regards to this because it is a complex thing all right and i'll tell you where we spend the most time all right is not on base things but i want to talk about here's the deal if you're a young coach and all you've ever done is coach the d-line you better listen to your secondary coach all right because he is the guy who can really, really tell you if he's good where I can make you right and you can make us right and allow us to soften up. Conversely, if you are a young secondary coach who wants to sit back and play cover two all day or cover three all day and you don't think they should, or soft cover four and you should never have to tackle and they should stop the front, they should stop, and you, let's say you're a four, a four DB team, okay, and you should stop the run with seven. Well, here's a newsflash, guys. If they put, if they're in a wing T or a double wing set, they've only got one split in out there. They got ten, and you got seven. All right. So, don't make football harder than it is. It is still a game of math. My numbers on defense have to equal your numbers. All right. So, it, it's in a it. It's still a game of understanding, okay, I'm a pass first player, I'm a run first player, or I am a 50-50 player, what I call a bonus linebacker in our system. So number one is always, it goes back to who are they, and then what are their base formations, and then how do we support DBs in the run game? All right. I listened to Trip Weaver, who's uh, – you know, one of my best friends in coaching, and he just got the safety's job at East Carolina. And they, they go through the same stuff. Uh, it, it's how do I get plus one against what they're getting screwed with is the RPO. And, okay, well, I can sit there and play man all game and load the box, which is always my first answer. Can I do it against you? Or do I have to start getting into some back away, back to, or if they're in the pistol, front side sets, whatever, um, 
you know, I don't know if he understands that, you know, pulling guard equals another gap on the other side that you got to deal with in the wing tee the way I do. But the theory is still the theory. <laughs> what do you have to do um, against the RPO game with the nickel Sam linebacker and the three safeties is the same thing that I've got to be able to do with all four of my DBs against the wing tee. Um, so that's number one. Do we need running back support in the run game? Uh, this is the game plan we'll always start with where we feel like corner and safety support, which is dictated by their formations. Certain schemes force you to get them involved, all right? And I mentioned we've played two triple option teams, three wing team teams this year. If they block their system worth a piss, my dog safety and my nub side corner, and sometimes we actually do invert and play a, a safety down and play a corner on the roof, whatever. My force players on each side are going to have to make some tackles if they block them at all. Now, sometimes their tackle can't down block Javian McCray, who signed at East Carolina. I mean, I get that. Players still make a huge difference, but I can't bank on him making the play 100 times. If I think he is, or if down and distance dictates, okay, if you run third and nine and you run buck sweep and you get five yards, that's okay. I'll soften that corner up so he doesn't get beat on the on the corner route. That happens as well. But on first and ten, or when a D and D dictates, you know, he's got a that corner now becomes a conflict player based on what they've done. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And then the answer dictates what fronts we can play. Some people say, I want to start with the front and work my way back. Friday night, winning and losing the game is dictated by how the offensive and defensive line plays and the turnover battle. But your game plan on defense should always be dictated on how do you get the bonus players in the proper set. Okay, and here's why I say that. So right, right here, I've got a standard. I hope you guys can see that. I'll make sure that we can share the screen. That should be on. So, like, this is a standard wing T set. Now, I had to go back and I had to learn re or relearn, I guess, as the case may be. But still, guys, people think stopping the wing T, stopping the RPO stuff. When you think about defense in terms of numbers and what it is, these four guys that I got in red are the guys that can make you right. So, in a 10 personnel set, I and they've got four wide receivers out there. Well, I've really got four DBs who are pass first, no run conflict defenders. The guy put in red would probably be that spur, that nickel Sam, whatever people call. Well, when I get in this particular set, they've now created a formation where they've created an extra gap thanks to a tight end. They've created an extra gap next to a wing. They've created basically a three back set and you know in the, the characteristics of a wing T set that the guard, the guards pull it on each side can create extra gaps in a formation. So in this particular formation, I've only got one pass first player, and that's that corner. So honestly, guys, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players have no conflict. Six are total run, all right, and one, this corner out here on this X is total pass. But if I want to play this out of a too high structure, I'm telling this corner, sorry, that safety should be, that spur right here should be black. So it should be seven against the, excuse me, seven or total roll. And now if they get past, you know, your Sam Mike, your wheel, or your spur wheel Mike, whatever you want to call it in this particular look, you know, they're all going to panic drop and, you know, cover crossers. I get all that. I'm just talking in general themes is right here, like this, these two guys right here, the corner and the free, and then this dog safety over here. They got to be able to read run pass and they're going to force it. So, you know, if I run buck sweep to the right where he goes down and they're gap down backer and I'm going to pull a guard, I'm going to pull one guard. If they block this worth of crap, this guard right here, I, what we actually do is what we call a wing adjust here where he's actually responsible for that gap. So that at least frees up where we might be able to hold the backside backer. But my point is they got to be able to see that block before he can trigger up the field. Because what happens if 
they give you something like the old waggle divide where one of them goes on the post and everything like that. So, you know, I to be sound against buck sweep or jet or whatever they do to this set, that corner and that free have to be able to read releases of verticals for pass, or they got to be able to read blocks so that they can trigger and get up to level one on the run play, if that makes any sense. Conversely, if I move to any other set, I can move to other sets, you know, where, oh, pardon me. If I move, let's go to what everybody else sees every every day this uh, in our new crazy world where you know people think this is all all the rage and I'm not gonna mess with the front that much, but with what we do, you know, there's your kind of a bastardized under front if you will. Well, at this point, you can basically take everything out of, let's play it in quarters. These guys ain't red no more, guys. Okay, so I know if you're a 10 or 11 personnel team, your conflict players essentially become this. Your, two, your safety, your weak side safety, the free in our defense, and the sand nickel, okay? Them corners ain't got to think as much. They got to be able to the key of, of, okay, if I get this route distribution, I've got this. All right. That's why I say, you know, that dictates what front I can play. All right. Because when we were in, when I've got this Sam and he's not a conflict player and he's down on the line of scrimmage, all right, I might be able to reduce this guy into a three technique. Well, if I play that front with this particular coverage system, well, you know, I can't play him in a three because now I've got a really soft D gap. You know, I might be able to get away with playing a four I, you know, in the tight front or the tack front and slow play and funnel everything out to him. But that's what I said. Okay, what do they do formation wise? And certain coverages cannot be played with certain fronts, all right? So figure out what coverages you have to play first, all right? But also don't let your defense or your DB coach sit there and say, okay, we got to play the wing T in soft cover three or cover four. I mean, that's just nonsense. Everybody understands that, but making sure I can get my first game plan is making sure, okay, if they can all block us, if they got eight in there and they can block my eight, how do we get the ninth man? All right, that's the first thing I, I got to ask because I can't bank on every year having Jamie McCray at nose tackle. Where or I mean, we were really good guys. Okay, I had three or four guys that you know there were a couple of games where we might have backed the DBs off, and I said, okay, don't even worry about it. We got a fourteen point lead; they're gonna have to throw it. Were we sound? Probably not. But I understood, you know, for instance, Brian Davis at North Brunswick did a great job. He got us in a ton of unbalanced. So we had to lock down and play cover three. All right. So he ran weak against cover three. All right. Meaning I had the corner in force, but he also had to carry that slot receiver to, or the, the wing down the field on a vertical. So you're not going to be very good against the pitch play weak in the triple option if they get you in cover three. But I understood that. We also had a 14 nothing lead. If it's a 7-7 seven to seven game, and we were pretty good on defense, so 14 to nothing felt pretty good. I'm saying 14 to nothing with eight minutes to go in the game. But if it's a 7-7 seven to seven game in the third quarter and they continually run lead option week and we're pitching and giving up six, seven yards of play, well, I would have had to figure out how to play that or get an extra hat and maybe reduce the front from the field so that I can get my boundary backer out to the force alley as well. Well, if that's the case, now I know I'm a little bit short, strong. That's just the cat and mouse game that when you have a system as opposed to a defense of the week that you know the answer to. So, I mean, they hit us for six or seven yards again, a play, and I could see our guys, they pitched it out there too, and they were just like, God, what's going on? Nobody runs for seven yards apiece. Well, we get to a timeout, or they call a timeout. I'm like, guys, it's okay. I know we're soft there. I right? rally and get them down. They don't have enough time to get down on the field. But in case of, if that's the play in the second quarter, like I said, okay, 
let's find a way to where we can get another hat to the weak alley, if that makes sense. So that kind of goes on to point A, point B, starting your defensive game plan back to front. B, those answers dictate what fronts you can play to certain personnel groupings or formations. And then this is where you end up sp spending all your time. I just mentioned Brian giving us unbalanced, um, which forced us into a cover three concept. Well, anybody who knows anything about cover three uh, out of a two high shell structure, anybody who knows that knows that, okay, you're soft away from rotation. So if I'm spinning left, on my defense, I'm going to be a little soft to the right. All right, we get that, unless I got a wheel backer. So what's my answer going to be if it's a tight game and I really need to worry about getting a hat to that weak alley? Do I need to be able to run? Do I need to be able to run the, the middle of the field safety to both alleys strong and play what we call fence technique? Do I need to widen the wheel backer out weak? Or do I need to slant the front to the boundary and our boundary outside backer instead of being in the rush is now a dropper. Okay, when we talk about the bastardized things that you get per week, this is what we talk about. Okay, sorry, I skipped point C. We'll talk about base fronts. Okay, carry about two or three pressures in, run blitzes, whatever you like to whatever they do. Don't, don't make it harder than it is and don't carry more than two or three because you don't have time to practice them and be good with your base fits. But then I was talking about deal with bastardized issues that come with all your base and early pressure fronts and early pressure coverages. What I mean here, we're talking about FSL, formation to the sideline, throw Tover in there, tackle over, throw true unbalanced four-man four -man surfaces, um, motion shifts, um, you know, on – perimeter structures like wide receiver bunch sets, nasty splits, um, stacks, all those things so that you get, you know, like I mentioned, our picks against Kerry uh, and Union Pines out of what we call our clamp call um, with our spur and dog, um, our Sam and our dog in our match concept, whatever. That's where you have to spend the majority of your time, all right, because – if, like I said, if the coordinator is worth the salt in what he does, he's thinking players, formations, then he's thinking plays. So, you know, once again, I, I use Dylan Demick at New Hanover as an example. I know what he's going to give me in terms of plays. What I don't know is what are his three or four wrinkles of the week that – I'm, I mean, he's shown bunch one game. He's shown the nasty split with the receivers one game. He's shown Tover one, one game with the tight end back week. You know, he's shown fight song and all of that. That's where you got to spend all your time against people who coach like that. And he's doing it, and he's not asking his kids to learn anything other than new formations. So once the play gets going, they're still able to go really fast. So, like, when we get ready to play against somebody like that, I'm spending really all my time on D. I, and what that does, that limits the menu of what we can do because there's certain blitz and pressures that we have to get out of our system that we have to check out because they you just can't run them against certain sets, certain unbalanced sets and whatever. Um, but the other thing is, is, you know, I've gotten really good at, sharpening my axe you know like the idea of talking about our kids well that spur linebacker against 21 personnel he spends a lot of time practicing playing a wing adjust nine technique because he knows when we get 12 personnel wing tight end wing that's what he's going to play and that's what he's going to play every week so you know I, the old air raid saying is i fear not the guy who practices you know, a thousand kicks one time, but the guy who practices one kick a thousand times, you know, I kind of subscribe to that theory that we're going to play three or four fronts. We're going to have two or three pressures and what you see is what you get. And we're, we're relatively predictable. What we're not predictable in is our, we, we deviate a lot with where we bring the reduction from and who the fourth rusher is in our Oki front and whether or not that movement that we use in our 404 four Oki front is a one man stunt or you might throw a long stick in there or whatever. But, you know, you can bet your rear end when you play us, you're going to get the 404, you're going to get the tight front, 
and you're going to get the field under fun, you know, with a boundary three technique. So, and we're going to know all the adjustments that come out of it. Then, you know, not to insult anybody's intelligence, but then you get into the defensive specifics of goal line, red zone, and coming out. One thing I've realized in high school football, I don't, I don't know how sophisticated people get in the red zone, you know, that or whether or not they change much of anything. Um, so we don't, you know, we're pretty much going to do what we do down there, you know, and I have one coverage inside the 10 that deviates from anything other than our base that we practice every week. But, you know, I'll be honest, we don't use it unless I think we need it. Um, and then, you know, third down is the money down. Third down is a lot like um, red zone. I think most people are so unsophisticated in pass protection at, at our level. You know, for instance, you pretty much know you're going to get uh, – everyone's got a sprint out protection. Everyone's got, you know, certain a screen that they like. And then everybody runs the base slide protection. And then everybody runs the basic six-man, half-man, half-slide protection. So we pretty much know what we're going to get. And that's going to dictate what man pressures we like and what zone pressures we like per week. Um, so, you know, I, I actually hold a lot of, I, I, watch, I mean, I watch game film on Sunday, but I really don't start diving into watching third down cutups until Monday or Tuesday because I really want to dial in um, and I want Caleb, our defensive coordinator, to be dialed in on what the base is. And, you know, because if you can get them into, if you can get high school football teams into consistent third and longs, they can't block you anyway. You know, because you just don't have enough time to coach pass protection the way it needs to be coached at the high school level. It doesn't mean people can't coach it. It means they don't have time to coach it um, unless that's what they do. All right? And like I mentioned, in our league, most people don't. So that's where you might see us a little bit more in a four-down front and we get into a jet mindset where, okay, I'm going to get out of the four technique so I can get those defensive ends a little bit more of an angle or, you know, we've been pretty blessed. Like I mentioned, we've been pretty blessed at corner. Um, you know, even though one of our guys is not very tall, he's a, he's a good player. He's, you know, we've got a 5'8 corner, and then we've got a 6-foot corner, and they're both really good players. So, you know, we've, we've really leaned toward, you know, bringing five and making you throw it quick and thinking you can't get off coverage. So, you know, once again, third down to me, just, it's player dictate. It's player dictated because they're probably not going to show you as much unbalance. They're not going to show you as much motion. Um, you know, they, they're really going to get into something that they don't do a lot of, which is drop back pass. But then, you know, to me, as you go through, when I talk about practice scripting and priority as the last one, we're talking about the hit chart. Okay, what are they doing on certain hashes, what are they doing on certain down and distances, and what are they doing out of certain formations and the ability, that's what I'm going to show you all week, you know, and and that's really what I think our kids do a great job of. Um, you know, I'm not going to give you eight. If I've got a script of 24 plays that we run on Monday and Tuesday against the team, and, you know, I can get into a discussion of how we were able to go a little bit faster on our scout team this year, and that might be something for another day. But um, you know, they're going to fit buck sweep if we play a wing T team. Seven out of twenty-four plays, they're going to fit weak side belly or or, or trap. Um, you know, three or four plays, and they're going to worry about waggle and waggle divide and the throwback and all that, you know, that's going to take up about 22 or 23 plays, you know, and if you get us with a screen, whatever, like a play of the week, that is what it is. Then we'll come to the field and we'll talk about it and adjust it. Um, but practice what you see on video because, you know, if, if they've got a system and that's what they believe in, uh, they'd probably do that better than a guy who has an offense of the week. So there's some of our theories on, on game planning and, and things that I think help us. Um, you know, certainly we're, we don't reinvent the wheel, but this does give you kind of the ABC one, two, three look at 
how we go about really our Sundays of what we do. Now I can get into some certain schemes or whatever, but that's the theories behind what we do to start with. Um, and, and how we get good at what we do. You guys have a good night and hope everybody remains safe.